Hello students, welcome to this session of Environment and Ecology where we are discussing previous year questions. In the last session, we have started our discussion of previous year questions and today we will resume our discussion of previous year questions. Yesterday or in the last session, we discussed about ecology. Now, today we will resume the leftover questions of ecology and then we will shift towards the discussion of pollution, right? So let us begin with this session. First question that we'll be discussing is, so now the questions of 2014 we'll be discussing. Question is, lichens, which are capable of initiating ecological succession even on a bare rock are actually a symbiotic association of which of the following, right? So the question is about lichens, which can form or which can initiate ecological succession even on a bare rock, right? So what is ecological succession? We have discussed in the last video also. Ecological succession is the process in which a composition of a particular ecosystem changes over a period of time. No ecosystem will have a constant composition of species. Rather, the composition of species is always in flux. And hence, these species keep on changing over a period of time. And that change is known as ecological succession. As we have discussed, ecological succession is of two types, primary succession and secondary succession. Primary succession on one hand is that which occurs on a bare or lifeless ecosystem. That means that ecosystem was never associated with life. But on the other hand, Secondary succession is that form of succession which occurs over a life or it occurs over a habitat which was associated with life earlier. But that life because of anthropogenic or natural reasons got destructed. And as a result of that, it became lifeless habitat. When life again originates on this habitat and when a complex community is developed in this habitat, that kind of succession is known as secondary succession, right? So lichens, these are, these are those species which can initiate ecological succession even on a bare rock. That means the conditions that are needed for the growth of lichens may not be very helpful. And hence, lichens are those species which can grow even in unfavorable environmental conditions. And they are a symbiotic association of algae and fungi. Lichens are a symbiotic association of algae and fungi, right? So what algae will do here? Obviously they will synthesize or they will produce food and they will receive nutrients. They will receive nutrients from fungi and these fungi will get food from algae, right? And in return, they are providing nutrients to algae. And as a result of this, this is a symbiotic association wherein both algae and fungi are getting benefited. And that's why the answer for this question is B. Lichens are a symbiotic association of algae and fungi. Right? So you can go through this particular discussion based upon which you can understand what kind of relation do 
algae and fungi share in lichens. So lichens will read this particular para, sorry, will read this particular para. So lichen, a lichen or lichenized fungus is actually two organisms functioning as a single stable unit. Lichens comprise a fungus living in a symbiotic relationship with an alga or cyanobacterium or both in some instances, right? So it is the symbiotic association of fungi and algae or in some cases it is fungi and cyanobacterium as well, right? So this point is important and that's why the answer to this question is answer to this question is we need fungi for sure. So fungi and algae, right? So that is the answer. Next now, so what are different types of symbiotic relationships? Just in few minutes we can discuss. So these biotic interactions have always remained important from UPSC's and other exams perspective because Based upon these interactions, life is possible on the surface of the earth because producers interact with consumers and consumers based upon this interaction will receive food from producers. Similarly, there is interaction between producers and consumers with decomposers and that's why all such interactions are important for the survival of life on the face of the earth. So other symbiotic interactions are first mutualism. So mutualism is, is that symbiotic interaction where both are getting benefited. Next is commensalism. Commensalism is that kind of interaction wherein one species is getting benefited and other species remains unaffected. For example, you can take the example of epiphytes. You can take the example of epiphytes. So epiphytes are those organisms or those plant species which will grow on other plant species and they only take support of those plant species and they are not accessing nutrients from those plant species on which they are growing. Right? So epiphytes are getting benefit as they are receiving physical support so that they can get access of sunlight based upon that physical support. But the plant on which epiphytes are growing is not losing in anything because only physical support is taken by epiphytes and that's why it is commensalism, right? Where one species receive benefits and other species remains unaffected. Next is parasitism. Parasitism is that kind of interaction which is called as negative interaction wherein one species receives benefit but other species is harmed because other species is losing on bodily fluids. It may be blood or any other body fluid, right? So as a result of this, the parasite which is living on host body, let's take an example, teaks living on the body of let's say dogs. So here teaks are receiving benefit because they are deriving food in the form of blood from dog's body. And on the other hand, dogs are or dog is affected as it is it is deprived of its body fluid, right? So that's why it is parasitism, a kind of negative interaction. Next is competition. Competition is that kind of interaction where the competition or where two species compete for same resources, right? And in this particular competition, both the species lose on those resources because those resources will be then divided and as a result of this competition is harmful 
to both these species which are participating in that competition right so that is about different types of interactions next now next question so with reference to neem tree consider the following statements so question is related to neem tree and its uses and its or its application first statement neem oil can be used as a pesticide to control the proliferation of some species of insects and mites second statement neem seeds are used in the manufacturing of biofuels and hospital detergents third statement neem oil has application in pharmaceutical industry so based upon the common understanding we know that neem and its products be it neem oil or any other product of neem it is used for its medicinal properties we know that in in food or in food grain storage neem leaves are used because of its medicinal properties because of its properties which may be harmful to the insects which cause harm to the food grains and that's why first statement is correct statement because neem oil derived from neem and its neem, uh, and its fruits can be used for the production of certain pesticides which will be harmful to insects and mites because these neem based pesticides will be depriving these pests of their food and that's why growth of these insects and mites will not occur as a result of which will be able to protect food grains or any other fruit from the attack of such insects and that's why first statement is correct statement next is neem seeds are used in the manufacturing of biofuels and hospital detergent so neem seeds and neem fruit have very important properties based upon which we can generate biofuels and even the hospital detergents so even second statement is correct statement so we'll discuss that statement so neem is a naturally occurring pesticide it is yellow brown yellow to brown has bitter taste and garlic kind of smell it is been used for hundreds of years for control pests and diseases so we know that it has been used for hundreds of year for the uh, protection of food grains neem oil is made of many compound as a dirachtin is the most active of these compounds or these components so this particular compound which is found in neem which is called as azadirachtin is the most active and it is it makes sure that the insects feeding and acting on various food grains are reduced their activities are reduced and that's why first statement as we have discussed is correct statement fine so first statement is correct statement next second statement which talks about use of neem oil for the production of biofuel is also correct because the oil corresponds to diesel except acidic value and sulfur content that means oil means neem oil neem oil corresponds to diesel except the acidic value of diesel and the sulfur content in the diesel but through some processes we can ensure that these are also these obstacles are also removed for example acid esterification can help to reduce the acid value which was followed by trans esterification or which can be followed by trans esterification to produce biodiesel fine so based upon the process known as acid esterification we can improve the or we can reduce the content of acid in neem oil so that it matches the acid level of diesel and that's why it can be used for or used as biodiesel and also for the production of certain detergents in 
hospital settings and that's why second statement is also a correct statement next statement next is the use of neem tree in pharma sector is the most well known use of neem and its products all parts of neem tree that means leaves flowers seeds fruits roots bark have been used traditionally for the treatment of inflammation infection fever skin diseases and dental disorders etc and that's why even third statement is correct because neem can be used in the production of certain medicines in pharmaceutical industries and that's why third statement is also correct and hence all these statements that are being given for neem are correct and hence answer is d i hope it is clear to you next now so which one of the following is a correct sequence of food chain so food chain we know that food chain represents the feeding pattern in an ecosystem and this particular feeding pattern is related to aquatic ecosystem it is related to aquatic ecosystem so which are the three animal or which are the three species of organisms that are given in this particular question first is diatoms second is crustaceans and third is herrings so we know that diatoms are algae they are the producers found in the aquatic ecosystem and that's why they should be at the first trophic level in any food chain fine so diatoms should be at the first trophic level and these two options b and d do not have diatoms at first place and hence we can eliminate them right now crustaceans crustaceans means crab kind of animals crab kind of species or insects so they are the primary consumers which can feed upon diatoms and hence they should be there at the second trophic level and that's why after diatoms it should be crustaceans and lastly it is herrings which is a species of fish which can feed upon various kinds of crustaceans and that's why answer of this question is a diatoms which are algae followed by crustaceans followed by herrings right so that is about uh, this particular question you can go through uh, this particular discussion of this question answer is a right next now next question consider the following species first bats second bears and third rodents the phenomenon of hibernation can be observed in which of the above kinds of animals so question is about hibernation phenomenon and we have to answer out of these three which are the species which will exhibit hibernation what is hibernation you must have heard about hibernation shown by the animal species living in higher altitudes or higher latitudes in the polar region for example as those locations have very cold conditions prevailing there the animal species living in those locations have certain kind of adaptability and the most important adaptability is in the form of hibernation what is hibernation hibernation is reduction in the activity reduction in the metabolism rate and even fall in the breathing process by these animals so that they can protect themselves from the cold conditions prevailing outside and they can use their stored food material for longer period of time that is hibernation right so out of these three 
which species show hibernation is the important question. So, before we go into that detail, let us discuss what is hibernation. Hibernation is a way for many creatures from butterflies to bats to survive cold, dark winters without having to forage for food or migrate to somewhere or migrate to somewhere warmer location. Instead, they turn down their metabolism to save energy and that is nothing but hibernation. So, primarily it is exhibited by those animal species which live in colder condition and in order to survive that cold condition, what they do? They reduce their body activities, they reduce their metabolism so that they can save energy which can last for longer duration till the time harsh winters are there. How does it work? How hibernation work? A hibernating animal's metabolism slows and its temperature plunges in, in ground squirrel, it can fall up to minus 2 degrees Celsius. Fine. So, as temperatures uh, are regulated in this particular activity of hibernation, it is the result of metabolism fall in the metabolism or slow down in the metabolism rate make sure that temperature falls in these animals next next feature that is exhibited by hibernating animals is slow breathing and other is production of natural antifreezes to survive in the in the frozen locations fine so such kind of such kind of adaptations are exhibited by these animals to survive harsh cold conditions. And that's why answer for this question is, so this particular adaptation is shown by mammals, insects, amphibians and reptiles as well. And that's why answer to this question is C, all of the above. Oh, sorry. See all of the above. Hibernation is exhibited by all of these. It is exhibited by bats, bears, rodents and other species of animals as well. Right? So, answer is 1, 2 and 3 that means C. Next now. Next question is. If you walk through countryside, you are likely to see some birds stalking alongside the cattle to seize the insects disturbed by their movement through grasses. Which one of the following is are such bird or birds? So the question is related to the Biotic association, biotic association or biotic interaction, but which kind of interaction? Which kind of interaction is this? This is commensalism. This is commensalism. Why commensalism? Before we discuss why it is commensalism, first of all, let us talk about why or what is commensalism. We have discussed just now, commensalism is that kind of positive interaction wherein one species gets benefit and other species remains unaffected, right? So, for example, we have discussed about epiphytes. Epiphytes are benefited with their association of epiphytes and larger plants. But larger plants are not affected out of this kind of association. They do not receive any benefit nor they are harmed during their association with epiphytes. Same is the case with this kind of association where cattle move along the countryside and as they move along the countryside, they disturb grasses and as grasses are disturbed by these cattle, there will be some birds which are moving along with these cattle so that those insects which are exposed as a result of disturbed grasses 
can be feeded upon or can be used by these birds. So in this association of birds and cattle, birds are receiving benefit in the form of insects which is their food and cattle are unaffected. Cattle do not have any positive or negative impact as a result of this. And that's why it is a commensalism kind of association. And this question is about commensalism. But you only have to identify which bird species you will be able to see in these countryside locations. So they have given you some, some examples or some options. So let us discuss these options, whether we can find these and these birds as the species of birds which are moving alongside cattle in the countryside location. So first is painted stork. So it is found in variety of wet habitats such as marshes, lakes, ponds, freshwater, freshwater swamp forest and also in the flooded cultivated fields. And that's why these painted stork they are feeding upon, they are not feeding upon insects, rather they feed upon small fishes. And that's why first choice is incorrect. Painted stock is not found in the countryside location and hence we should eliminate it. Next is, before we go to common mina, let us discuss black-necked crane. So black-necked crane is found in the Himalayan locations. It is at the high altitude wetlands in the Tibetan plateau and that's why it is again not found in the countryside location. And that's why you should eliminate this black-necked crane along with painted stock. And that's why it is common maina, it is common maina which feeds upon grasshoppers, flies, locusts, caterpillars, beetles, etc, etc, which may be living in grasses and which may be exposed as a result of movement of cattle through those grasses. And that's why common maina is the right choice for this question and hence answer is B. So answer is B2 only that means common maina. Fine. So I hope it is clear to you. Though the question is related to the biotic interaction that is commensalism, the question is asked related to the species of birds which will be seen in the countryside locations which are living in commensalism biotic kind of biotic interaction with cattle. Right. So that is about this question. Next question now. So now we'll be discussing about 2015's questions. Question is, with reference to bio toilets used by Indian railways, consider the following statements. So you must be aware of the fact that now the Indian railways has started using bio toilets. And during that particular time, that means during 2015, that was current affairs. And hence the question was asked on those bio toilets being introduced by Indian Railways. So question is, statements are first, the decomposition of human waste in bio toilets is initiated by fungal inoculum. The question is, the statement is, the decomposition is initiated by fungal inoculum. Fine. So that is first statement. Second statement is, ammonia and water vapor are the only end products in this decomposition which are released into the atmosphere. You have to select correct statements from the these two statements. So first of all, we'll discuss second statement. See, second statement talks about ammonia and water vapor as the only end products. See, these kind of words, only, then, then uh, some, only some, these kind of words should make you alert. 
I'm not saying that you should eliminate those statements directly. No, such kind of extreme words, not some, in this case, not some, because some is not exactly an extreme word, but only is an extreme word, right? So whenever you will see such kind of words in any statement, you should become alert and you should read that statement once again. So ammonia and water vapor are the only byproducts through, through this process of decomposition which are released into atmosphere. See, whenever such kind of words are there, you should become alert and the process which is used in bio toilets in Indian railways, it is not only emitting water vapor, but it is also emitting methane and carbon dioxide and that's why these two byproducts are not the only byproducts and hence it is incorrect right so second statement is incorrect statement now first statement talks about the process of decomposition of human waste is being carried out by fungal inoculum but we know that it is not fungal inoculum that is used in the decomposition. Rather, bacteria are used for the decomposition of these human waste. Fine. So, let us discuss this first statement. The bio toilets, which have been developed by DRDO, have a colony of anaerobic bacteria. They have a colony of anaerobic bacteria kept in a container under the lavatories that convert human waste into water and small amount of gases. The gases are released into atmosphere and water is discharged after chlorination onto the track. So it is not the fungal inoculum rather a colony of anaerobic bacteria that is used for the decomposition in bio toilets and that's why first statement is again incorrect statement. So both these statements are incorrect and hence answer is, so both these statements are incorrect and hence answer is D, neither one nor two, right? So I hope it is clear to you. See what you have to focus upon in this discussion of previous year questions. You will have to focus upon the type of questions that are being asked and also the way UPSC is asking questions. Throughout this discussion of ecology questions, see we have not completed ecology questions but still throughout this discussion you must have noticed that question is conceptual based. Hardly any factual questions are asked and that's why for ecology your clarity of concepts is important. right? So next question we'll be discussing and that is the question related to the definition of ecosystem. So the most basic question that was asked in 2015 and still, so though on the face of it, it looks quite basic, but the options are quite close and that's why it makes this question confusing. Fine. So let us discuss this question. Which of the following is the best description of the term ecosystem? Let me read the options in this case. A, a community of organisms interacting with one another. So what we will do, we will discuss these options one by one. So let us discuss first option, a community of organisms interacting with one another. So whenever we talk about community, so community of organisms, community of organisms consist of the species of organisms living in a particular location. So let us consider that this is a habitat and in this habitat different species are living. So these three, these three species will form a community for this habitat right and these species as as we are as we are saying 
that these are the species that means they are the living beings hence in community we do not take into account the abiotic factors of the environment rather it is only biotic factors that are included under community and this particular statement first statement says that community of organisms interacting with one another so this option a is quite incomplete option because ecosystem is not only related to the biotic factors rather abiotic factors are included are also included in ecosystem and that's why this is incorrect option b that part of the earth so ecosystem is that part of the earth which is inhabited by living organisms so this is quite simple so that part of the earth which is inhabited by living organism is known as biosphere and not the ecosystem it is known as the biosphere and not the ecosystem because we know that biosphere is a point of interaction between hydrosphere atmosphere and lithosphere where living organisms are found or living organisms live and that's why second or option b is also incorrect right next now a community of organisms together with the environment in which they live right so we'll keep this aside let us discuss next the flora and fauna of geographical area the flora and fauna of geographical area then again here focus is on the biotic components focus is on biotic components even if we can say that the geographical area is being uh, is being given so here geographical area may consist of land water soil etc etc but there is no interaction that is being talked about in this particular option d which is important for any ecosystem to survive right so option or correct choice for this question is a community of organisms a community of organisms that means biotic components that means biotic component together with the environment together with the environment that means a biotic component in which they live in which they live that means this living is possible only as a result of interaction between these biotic components and abiotic components and also between biotic and biotic and abiotic and abiotic interaction so this choice is the best suited to explain this word ecosystem and that's why answer is c so you can read this definition of ecosystem an ecosystem is a natural functional unit comprising living organisms and their non living environment fine so it consists of both living organisms and their non living environment that interacts with each other so interacts with each other to form a stable self supporting system and right? so this is important and that's why answer is c so answer for this question is c right next now next is biological oxygen demand is a standard criteria for so now we are discussing questions of 2017 so biological oxygen demand is a standard criteria for which of the following so we know that biological oxygen demand is an indicator of pollution in a particular water body because based upon biological oxygen demand we can identify the dissolved oxygen in a particular water body so here 
there are two important concepts that are involved. Let us discuss those concepts. Firstly, in order to understand biological oxygen demand, firstly we will have to understand the dissolved oxygen. Right? So, what is dissolved oxygen? Dissolved oxygen. So, dissolved oxygen as name suggests is the concentration of oxygen present in a water body. Concentration of oxygen present in a water body. Right? And this oxygen is used by various organisms living in that water body. Right? Second concept is biological oxygen demand. Biological oxygen demand. So, biological oxygen demand is that indicator of a particular water body based upon which we can easily identify the presence of pollutants in water body. So, in order to carry out decomposition of organic matter which is introduced in a water body as a result of pollution, let us say from nearby city, as a result of this pollution, organic matter is introduced in water body and there will be various microorganisms which will be using this particular organic matter to derive their food and this process is known as decomposition right so whenever microorganisms are deriving their food from dead organic matter they are they are carrying out decomposition of that matter so, as this decomposition is being carried out by microorganisms, they will use up oxygen present in that water body for their own activities. And as they are using oxygen for their own activities, they are depleting the oxygen dissolved in that water body. And hence, with this process of decomposition by microorganisms, the dissolved oxygen contained in water body decreases and based upon this we can easily identify whether a particular water body is polluted or not right so biological oxygen demand is the demand of oxygen by microorganisms to carry out degradation or decomposition of biodegradable organic matter so, in biological organic demand, sorry, biological oxygen demand, what is degraded by these organisms? It is only that organic matter which is biodegradable, right? So, this particular concept tells us about the use of oxygen by microorganisms to carry out decomposition of biodegradable waste material. And hence, it is an indicator of water pollution. So, let us come back to the question. So, biological oxygen demand is a standard criteria for measuring oxygen in blood? No. Computing oxygen levels in forest ecosystem? No. Pollution assay in aquatic ecosystem? Yes. Assessing oxygen level in high altitude regions? No. Right? So, it is answer is C, pollution assay in aquatic ecosystem. So, related to this, there are two very important concepts. We will be discussing those concepts as well, but at your home, you should go through this particular discussion. Right? At your home, please go through this discussion. Next. So, answer we know that it is C. The biological oxygen demand tells us about the oxygen used up by decomposers to carry out biodegradation of 
organic waste material present in water body and that indicates the level of pollution of that water body. So next concept related to this is chemical oxygen demand. So this is also very essential or very important con concept. So chemical oxygen demand measures the amount of oxygen that will be consumed by the chemical breakdown or oxidation of organic pollutants in water. So it is not that all the pollutants that are present in water body are biodegradable. There will be non-biodegradable non pollutants also in water body and for them or in order to reduce them we have to carry out or the process that is carried out in water body is chemical oxidation wherein chemically these elements which are non-biodegradable will be reduced to simpler forms and hence this chemical oxygen demand is also an indicator of level of pollution in a water body right next is fecal contamination of water so we know that fecal contamination of water may be carried out if untreated sewage wastewater is released in a nearby water body and as a result of this there will be entry of various pathogens in a water body so let us discuss this particular question water pollution caused by fecal contamination is a serious problem due to potential of contracting diseases from pathogens the presence of pathogens is determined with indirect evidence by testing for indicator organisms such as coliform bacteria right so how we can find out the presence of pathogens which are entering as a result of introduction of fecal matter in water body so we may rely on some indicator bacteria which can tell us about the presence of pathogens coming from fecal matter and those bacteria are coliform bacteria and that's why coliforms so next point coliforms are bacteria that are always present in digestive tract of various animals including human beings and are found in the waste material produced by these animals they are also found in plants and soil material as well so coliform bacteria if it is present in water body then we can say that there will be pathogens present in water body coming from fecal waste matter of animals as well as human beings right so apart from biological oxygen demand even chemical oxygen demand and fecal contamination of water which can be determined by the presence of these bacteria coliform bacteria is important in this question right next now next question now we are discussing 2018's question next question is which of the following leaf modifications occur occurs in the desert areas to inhibit water loss so the question is about the adaptations adaptations in desert adaptations in a desert because we know that in desert areas there is scarcity of water and in order to survive in desert areas plant species as well as animals will have to exhibit various kind of adaptations and these adaptations which are exhibited by plants in order to live in drier conditions of desert are known as xerophytic plants so these plants are known as xerophytic plants that means those plants which have adaptations to live in drier conditions similarly these plants in general will have ferrothrophytes ferrothrophytes that means they will be excessively dependent on subsurface moisture to derive water for their life processes right so 
let us discuss this question. This question gives us few adaptations. We have to identify whether these are the leaf modifications that are exhibited by desert area plants to inhibit water loss. So first is hard and waxy leaves. Second is tiny leaves. And third is thorn instead of leaves. Fine. So the question is about leaf modifications in desert areas to inhibit water loss. So let us discuss this question. So what are the adaptations that are shown by plants in desert areas? First is thick waxy skin to reduce loss of water and to reflect heat. So to reduce loss of water through transpirational loss, thick and waxy skin or waxy material is present on the, on the desert plants. Second, second adaptation, large fleshy stem to store water. So large and fleshy stem will be present in these, these plants to store water because water is scarce and whenever they get water, that water should be stored so that life can be extended till the time water is available next time. Next adaptation, thorns and thin spark, spiky or glossy leaves to reduce water loss. So again, it is a adaptation exhibited by these plants. Next, spikes to protect cacti from animals wishing to use stored water. So as water is scarce in these locations, animals may use plants to derive water. But to inhibit such action by animals, these plants have thorns or spikes, right? So that is also an adaptation. Next, deep roots to tap groundwater. Deep roots to fetch groundwater from, from different locations. Long shallow roots which spread over a wide area. So roots are spread across a wide area and they may be shallow in some cases, right? So shallow roots but spread across a wide location so that water can be fetched from those wide locations. Last is plants lie dormant for years until rain falls. Fine. So there are certain species of plants which are available in desert locations which are called as which are called as rain perennial. Which are called as rain perennial plants. What is rain perennials? See, as name suggests perennial, these plant species will be there or will be living inside the ground, but will be able to see them only when it rains in desert locations. And that's why they are called as rain perennial. So this picture tells you about the different kinds of adaptations that is exhibited by plants in desert area. So based upon this discussion, we can say that all of these are correct choices with respect to the adaptations exhibited by plants in desert area to inhibit water loss. And that's why answer is 1, 2 and 3. Right? Next now. Apart from these adaptations exhibited by plants, even animals have these kind of adaptations. So thick eyebrows, closing nostrils so that these, these parts, that means eyes and nose, can be protected from sand of desert. Then thick fur, so that in night, whenever temperature falls excessively, these animals are protected. Next, well camouflaged, that means in order to make sure that the, uh, the animals are protected from 
the other carnivores in that location they are well camouflaged. Next wide feet so that they can easily walk on sand and their, their feet do not sink inside the sand. Next hump, hump is there to store fat so that they can live without food for longer duration. Next long eyelashes again to protect them from the sand of desert and hairy ears again for same purpose to protect ears from sand right so these are the adaptations which are exhibited by animals in desert locations next question now with reference to agricultural soils consider the following statement so the question is in general about agricultural soils it is not about any specific kind of agricultural soil so statements are a high content of organic matter in soil drastically, so again extreme word, drastically reduces its water holding capacity. Right. Second statement, soil does not play any role in sulfur cycle. Third statement, irrigation over a period of time can contribute to salinization of some agricultural lands. You have to select correct statements from these three statements. So let us discuss this question. This question is in general about agricultural soil. They have not mentioned any specific agricultural soil. So we will take into account the characteristics of agricultural soil in general. So let us discuss various statements starting with first. A high content of organic matter in soil drastically reduces its water holding capacity. So first of all, what is organic matter? See organic matter in soil may be coming from the plants that means dead plant material or fallen leaves and also from animals. So dead and decaying animals and plants are the source of organic material in the in in any soil and whenever this dead or decaying organic material is completely decomposed it is converted into humus and whenever organic matter or humus is present in any soil it increases its water holding capacity and that's why first statement is incorrect statement. With organic matter, water holding capacity will increase, not decrease. Second statement, soil does not play, a, does not play any role in sulfur cycle. So this is about the biogeochemical cycles. This statement is about the biogeochemical cycles. So I hope you are aware of these biogeochemical cycles because this is the most basic os aspect of any uh, of environmental studies because we have came across these cycles in our school days as well. So biogeochemical cycles which are also called as nutrient cycles are those cycles based upon which nutrients nutrients which may be present in various abiotic components of the environment that means it may be present in the form of gases it may be present in soil or it may be present in other sources right so nutrients are made available to the biotic components are made available to biotic components through various processes which we'll discuss during our discussion of biogeochemical cycles in regular lectures. And when these nutrients are made available to the biotic components of the environment, these nutrients help to achieve the potential growth for these biotic components. And once they die, 
once these biotic components that means plants and animals when they die it is decomposes that make sure that these nutrients that are being used up by biotic components are again released back to the soil or they are added to the atmosphere right so that's why it is known as a cycle where nutrients are used from abiotic components by producers and consumers and when producers and consumers die these nutrients are again added to those abiotic components of the environment right so that is the biogeochemical cycle so basically there are two types of biogeochemical cycles first is gaseous cycles and second is sedimentary cycles gaseous cycle is in the form of nitrogen cycle carbon cycle water cycle etc and the sedimentary cycles are primarily two and the most important is phosphorus cycle and second is sulfur cycle sulfur cycle is a process based upon which sulfur is made available to the biotic components and through biotic components it is again released into the abiotic components of the environment and whenever sulfur is made available to biotic components it is made available through rocks and minerals associated with rocks and that's why soil plays an important role in sulfur cycle and hence second statement which says that second statement which says that soil does not play any role in sulfur cycle is incorrect again so both these statements are incorrect now third statement over irrigation sorry irrigation over a period of time can contribute to the salinization of some agricultural land we know that water consists of various salts and one of the important salt is uh, present in water is sodium and as over use of or over irrigation of a particular agricultural land is being carried out by farmers as that over irrigation or over irrigated water evaporates or percolates it leaves behind salts and those salts lead to salinization of that agricultural land as a result of which the permeability of soil may reduce and hence third statement is correct statement and that's why answer of this question is b3 only right so that is about this question and and that is about our discussion of questions related to ecology so last question from ecology that was asked was from 2018 thereafter ecology has means from ecology upsc has not asked many questions so it is always a topic which will be of focus by upsc to ask questions so that is about our discussion of previous year questions related to ecology now we will shift towards the previous year questions of pollution so now we will be discussing about questions related to pollution that have been asked by upsc in previous year questions so let us start with first question that is asked in 2010 and that is question is indiscriminate disposal of used fluorescent electric lamps causes mercury pollution in the environment why is mercury used in manufacturing of these lamps so why mercury is used in the manufacturing of fluorescent electric lamp that is the question so we will discuss this particular question so mercury is used in the manufacturing of the fluorescent lamps because whenever electric current is passed through these fluorescent lamps mercury leads to leads to emission of uv radiations 
mercury leads to a emission of uv radiations and as a result of these uv radiations the light is produced but we know that uv radiations are not visible to human eye and hence to make sure that light is produced from these uv radiations phosphor is used in the inner side of these lamps so it is phosphor as a result of which the mercury lights or the lights where mercury is being used will glow and hence the answer for this question is or the logic behind the use of mercury in these fluorescent lamp is that as we pass electric charge through the lamps which are using mercury mercury leads to emission of ultraviolet radiations and that's why the correct statement for this question is b when the lamp is switched on that means whenever we pass electric current through these lamps the mercury in the lamp causes emission of ultraviolet radiations right and mind you these ultraviolet radiations are not visible to us and hence to make sure that light is produced from these lamps what we use we use phosphor as inner coating of these lamps fine so answer to this question is b why mercury is used because as electric charge is passed through the mercury which is used in these lamps it leads to production of uv radiation next question next question is salinization occurs when the irrigation water accumulated in the soil evaporates so we have just now discussed that during our discussion of 2018's question related to ecology that the over irrigation leads to salinization and salinization is nothing but accumulation of salts in soil as water gets evaporated eventually so salinization occurs when the irrigation water accumulated in soil evaporates leaving behind salt and minerals what are the effects of salinization on the irrigated land so what are the result of salinization on this irrigated land so options are a it greatly increase the crop production see it is not possible increase in the crop production in the saline or salinization land is not possible because salinization is nothing but accumulation of salts like sodium and chlorine and these are not the factors these are not the nutrients which are useful for crop growth and hence first statement is incorrect statement second is it makes some soils impermeable so this statement is correct statement because let's assume that let us consider that this is a soil and there are many soil particles in this upper stage of soil and so these are let us assume that these are soil particles right so whenever there is no no salinization of this particular land water which may flow from this particular land may enter inside and can go towards the ground water right so that is possible because there are no salts in this particular soil and that's why there will be lots of gaps in the soil particles through which water can percolate inside but now what has happened
So now what has happened? There is accumulation of salt in this particular soil. So let us consider that these are the salts. Fine. So there is accumulation of salts now. So what salts have done? Salt have filled the gaps which are present in the which are present in the soil particles and as a result of these gaps if any water flow on this particular soil it will not be able to permeate inside the soil because the gaps of soil particles have been filled up by the salts of water that have been left behind as a result of evaporation and hence if if salinization occurs in a particular land then it will lead to reduction in the permeability of soil fine so it makes soil impermeable and that's why this is the answer to your question so answer for this question is b answer is b but as this question is important we will discuss all other options as well so first option was about the increase in the crop production as a result of as a result of salinization so soil salinity is one of the most important global problems that negatively affects crop productivity so it is not the productivity is increasing no that is not possible because whenever salinization occurs in any soil it is sodium and chlorine which are present in that soil and these are the stress developers in the soil and that's why they are not favorable for the growth of crops and hence first statement is incorrect second statement is correct because we have already discussed that the presence of salt particles reduces the salinity next is so uh, third option is let us read third option it raises the water table so let us discuss why this option is incorrect as soil becomes less permeable with increasing salinization of land there will be no question of percolation of water and there is no question of increase in water table and that's why this is also incorrect next option d is it fills the air spaces in the soil with water so it fills the air spaces in the soil with water which is again incorrect because it is not water that is being filled inside the air spaces present in the soil rather it is salts which will fill those air spaces fine so let us discuss this saline soils have some of the poorest soil physical conditions and have slow permeability to air and water resulting in less gas exchange needed for plants to grow and hence it is not the water that is being filled up in the air spaces but the salt coming from water that means sodium or chlorine that is being filled in these air spaces and hence even option d is incorrect and that's why correct choice is b so next question is so i hope you have understood the last question so salinization is important because it leads to fall in the production of crop and hence we need to address this problem of salinization next question there is a concern over the increase in harmful algal blooms in the sea waters of india what could be the causative factors for this phenomenon so before we discuss the causative factors of algal algal blooms let us firstly discuss about 
what are exactly algal blooms algal blooms are the excessive growth that are occurring in a water body of algae and often blue green algae what is the reason behind this excessive growth it is the availability of nutrients from where nutrients are coming for this excessive growth of these algae nutrients may be sourced from various land based runoffs of water which not only brings various pollutants but also nutrients from land and as a result of increasing amount of land nutrients in a water body there will be favorable conditions for the growth of algae and hence that is nothing but the main factor which will drive the growth of algae right so that is nothing but algal bloom which is excessive growth of algae in a water body so the question is about the reasons behind this excessive growth of algae or algal bloom so let us discuss what are the statements that are being given so first statement is discharge of nutrients from the estuaries so first of all what are estuaries estuaries are those locations where land or the river meets with oceans or seas estuaries are the locations where rivers that means those water streams which are coming from land meets the oceans or seas and these are the estuaries where we will have presence of brackish water which is neither fresh water present on land nor marine water or saline water present in the oceans and that's why the salinity in the waters of estuaries vary from 0 to 35 ppt right so these estuaries as they are close to land they will make sure that nutrients are made available to water body and hence as a result of those nutrients algal bloom may occur and that's why first statement is correct statement second is a runoff from the land during monsoon again whenever monsoon rain occurs there will be increase in the water volume from a river as a result of which there will be excessive flow of water from land to sea and whenever there is flow of water from land to sea even nutrients are carried towards the sea and that may lead to increased availability of nutrients which may trigger algal bloom in sea waters and that's why second statement is also correct statement third is upwelling in the seas yesterday during our discussion of ecology based previous year questions we have discussed about upwelling upwelling is that phenomenon which occurs as a result of movement of winds so as winds blow over a surface of oceans the surface water of oceans is moved and that place is filled up by the ground water or water which is present at the bottom right so bottom water moves to take the place of surface water displaced by winds and this is nothing but upwelling and we have discussed that upwelling make sure that nutrients which is present at the ground or at the bottom of oceans are brought to the surface and this also may trigger algal blooms and that's why even third statement is correct statement and hence all these factors may be causing or may be a causative factor for algal bloom phenomenon right so that's why answer to this question is d 
you can read this this particular explanation at your home so answer is d next now consider the following statements first carbon dioxide oxides of nitrogen oxides of sulfur which of the above is or are the emission or emissions from coal combustion at the thermal power plant so which are the emissions out of these as a result of combustion of coal in thermal power plants so uh, you have to select correct choice from these options we know that coal is a fossil fuel and as it is a fossil fuel it will be emitting various kinds of gases which may be carbon monoxide carbon dioxide oxides of sulfur oxides of nitrogen etc and that's why all these are the probable gases which may be coming out of thermal power plants which are using coal fine so coal is a hard rock which can be burned as solid fossil fuel it mostly consists of carbon so mostly coal is a uh, coal is a hard rock consisting of carbon but it also contains hydrogen sulfur oxygen and nitrogen as well as a result of which it will emit all these gases that are given in this question that means carbon dioxide sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide nitrous oxide etc etc fine so whenever coal is burned carbon dioxide sulfur dioxide nitrogen oxides and mercury compounds are released and that's why answer is d so i hope it is clear to you next question now what is the role of ultraviolet radiations in water purification systems so what is the role of uv radiations in purification of water statements are a sorry first it inactivates or kills the harmful microorganisms present in water second statement it removes all the undesired undesirable odors from the water third statement it quickens the sedimentation of solid particles removes turbidity and improves the clarity of water right so you have to find out correct statements from these three statements for the role of uv radiations that is being used in various water purification systems so let us discuss this question before we discuss the role of uv radiations let us understand what are uv radiations so uv radiations are a part of electromagnetic spectrum so this is electromagnetic spectrum and these are the rays of lower energy and these are the rays of high energy so radio waves microwaves infrared waves are the low energy waves or low energy rays including visible light rays that means those rays of or those rays of electromagnetic spectrum which are visible to us they are also consist, considered as lower energy rays uv rays are lying here so these this is the part of uv rays that means they are they have higher energy than the visible and infrared spectrum of light but they have lower energy compared to x ray and gamma ray spectrum of light right so that is the uv rays they are a part of electromagnetic spectrum and they are uh, these are the radiations which may come from sun or man made sources like tanning beds and welding torches as well basically there are three types of uv rays so uh, uv rays are the middle are in the middle of the spectrum that we have discussed so basically there are 
three main groups of UV rays, UVA, UVB and UVC. These UV rays have different application based upon their energy. So UVA are the rays that have least energy among all UV rays. And these rays can cause skin cells to age and can cause some indirect damage to DNAs of our cells. Fine. So UVA rays are harmful to our skin as well as DNA. Next, UVA rays are mainly linked to long-term skin damage such as wrinkles, but they are also thought to play a role in some skin diseases. So whatever skin problems we may face as a result of UV rays, they are the result of UVA rays. Next, UVB have slightly more energy than UVA rays. They can damage DNA in skin cells directly and are main rays that can cause sunburns. Fine. So sunburns is the result of UVB and they have the potential to directly affect DNA of our cells as they have higher energy compared to UVA rays. Next, they are also thought to cause most skin cancers, right? Next, UVC rays have more energy than other types of UV rays. Fortunately, because of this high energy, they react with ozone high in our atmosphere and don't reach to the ground. So they are not normally a risk factor for skin cancer. So as these are the rays with high energy, they react with ozone layer in the stratospheric heights as a result of which they are being absorbed by ozone layer itself and they do not reach to the ground and thus they are not causing skin related problems. But UVC rays can also come from some man-made sources such as arc welding torches, mercury lamps, UV sanitizing bulbs used to kill bacteria and other germs in water and food. Fine. So it is not that UVC is only coming from the sun. But even some man-made sources are also there for the generation of UV rays. And it is these UV rays which can be used for sanitizing uh, or killing bacteria which may be present in water or any food material. Next point. So now let us consider the question. So question is about the use of UV rays in water purification. So we will discuss different statements that are being given by this question. So first statement is as a water treatment technique, UV is known to be an effective disinfectant due to its strong germicidal. That means it inactivates various bacteria which may be present in water and hence UV rays are used to kill any bacteria which may be present in the water. And that's why first statement is correct statement, right? Next, second statement, UV system destroys 99.99% .99 of harmful microorganisms without adding chemicals or changing water's test or odor. And hence, even second statement is, uh, sorry, second statement is incorrect because UV, use of UV does not lead to change in odor or test of water. But second statement talks about the fact that or it, it talks about the, so uh, it removes, so second statement says that UV rays are used in water purification because it removes all the undesirable odors from water but that is not the case because UV rays though kill various kinds of bacteria they do not alter test or odor of water and hence second statement 
is incorrect statement. Next now, third statement. So third statement is about the uh, use of UV in water purification as it quickens the sedimentation of solid particles and removes turbidity in water. So let us discuss this third statement. This third statement is not correct because it is not the role of UV rays to increase the sedimentation of sediments present in water. Rather that is done through the reverse osmosis process and hence third statement is incorrect and that is why answer is A that means one only. UV rays are used in water purification systems only to kill bacteria which may be present in that particular water and hence answer is A one only. Next question is consider the following statements just a minute. Consider the following statements, chlorofluorocarbons CFCs known as ozone depleting substances are used for first in the production of plastic foams, second in the production of tubeless tires, third in cleaning certain electronic components, fourth as pressurizing agents in aerosol cans. You have to select the correct use of CFCs out of these given uses. So let us discuss this particular question. We know that CFCs are ozone depleting substances and the most popular use of CFCs is in refrigeration industry. But it was earlier used in refrigeration industry. These days we are not using chlorofluorocarbons in refrigeration rather we are using hydrochlorofluorocarbons in refrigeration which are not ozone depleting substances the way chlorofluorocarbons work. Right. So, so sorry uh, I beg your pardon it is not hydrochlorofluorocarbons that are used in refrigerations these days it is hydrofluorocarbons HFCs right. So, let me clarify. So, CFCs are ozone depleting substances which were earlier used for refrigeration but now we are not using these CFCs as they are ozone depleting substances rather we have started use of hydrofluorocarbons as a gas in refrigeration and these are not these are not ozone depleting substances right so that is the clarification so popular use of cfc is refrigeration but there are many other uses of chlorofluorocarbons as well let us discuss these statements one by one to understand whether chlorofluorocarbon is used in these uses or not. First is in the production of plastic foams. So chlorofluorocarbons is produced or it is used to produce plastic foams which are used as insulations and hence first statement is correct statement. Second statement is in the production of tubeless tires but rather it is nitrogen that is used in the production of tubeless tires and hence second statement is incorrect. Now as you know that second statement is incorrect you should remove those statements where second statement is already there. So you should remove this and you should remove this right. Now you know that answer is from C or B. And in C or uh, you, you also know that first use of CFC that means 
the use of CFC in the production of plastic foams for insulation is correct and hence you should also eliminate this and your answer is C. Right. So that is elimination that we have discussed earlier as well. So such kind of elimination methods you should practice but we will discuss other options as well. So third statement is in cleaning certain electronic components. So uh, CFCs have certain properties which makes them suitable for cleaning electronic particles or electronic components, right? And that's why third statement is correct statement. And last is as pressurizing agent in aerosol scan or uh, aerosol cans. So earlier the deodorants or sprays that we were using had the presence of chlorofluorocarbons. And that's why even this is correct and hence answer is C. 1, 3 and 4 only. Right? So that is about our discussion of this question. You can go through all these different ozone depleting substances including chlorofluorocarbons. But these ozone depleting substances as you must be aware of the fact that have been phased out through Montreal Protocol. Through Montreal Protocol we have phased out ozone depleting substances because they were leading to ozone hole and hence these days we use hydrofluorocarbons in refrigeration instead of chlorofluorocarbons fine so that is about this question moreover you can go through this list of use of chlorofluorocarbons in various fields and that's why answer to this question is C. So you can go through this list of use of these chlorofluorocarbons in various sectors. But these days we have shifted away from the use of chlorofluorocarbons as these are ozone depleting substances phased out by Montreal Protocol. And that is about our discussion of these previous year questions. In the next session, we will resume our discussion of previous year questions related to pollution. Thank you for your time. I am Rajvardhan Bodekar signing off. See you in the next session. Thank you.